The Noldeke Shwalian paradigm says that the Quran, as we know it today, comes down to us through Uthman, and we should accept it at face value. However, Dr. Stephen Shoemaker is not willing to accept this notion of no questions asked policy. Today, we are going to take a different look. We're going to look at something interesting, and we're going to call it the Noldeki Shualian paradigm. Uh, you know, if you want to go and Google it right now, I would say hold your horses because Jay is going to unpack all of this. So, Jay, what is it that we're talking about? I know who Noldeki is, obviously, but for the sake of the people who will be watching. But you have no idea who Shuali is. Well, that's yeah. why it's a mouthful, and I'm surprised yeah. you even got done through it. You got it. Yeah. You said it correctly. Most people cannot even say it that well. It is a tongue twister, but that's not really what's important. We're getting back now to what Shoemaker is saying. We're getting back to his book, and he is now bringing up some, uh, some real problem here. He's saying this whole idea that Uthman is the one responsible, what we just went through all these last episodes, going through all these uh, the reference after reference in... Al-Buhari, Volume 6, Hadith number 509 and 510, uh, where this was all done by Uthman. That means everything happens at Uthman, has some real problems. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, there is two men who are responsible for pinpointing and zeroing in, much like what Wilfred Smith did earlier with the whole idea that you must not ever write anything or publish anything or say anything publicly mm -hmm. uh, that is not considered... Uh, that is not acceptable to the Muslim community, and that became a, a paradigm for all scholars and academics that exists even today in the 21st century, though it was done in the last century. We go even further back to Noldeke and Schwali, these two different scholars who were introducing this idea in Germany, which then permeated the rest of the academia in Europe, which then permeated academia here, and it's called the noldeke schwalian paradigm. And basically, it's it's just that, the idea that Uthman is the one we have to go to, that the Quran we have today was written down in 652 in its entirety, all 114 surahs, everything you see here in this book here, was written at that time, and that we should not criticize it, we just should accept it at face value. Who is Noldeke, who is Schwali? Well, no, Theodor Noldeke uh, is a, from Germany. He was the one, he was uh, born... Uh, in the 1800s, I can't remember the first exact day, he died in 1919. But this paradigm, uh, this uh, idea was introduced by him when he was in his 30s. He was very young, in 1860. So he was born in the 1830s, and by 1860 he introduced this paradigm. We must accept what the Islamic tradition say. There's no other, there's really nothing else out there. There's nothing else that we need to go to. Therefore, use it as... And what, what we must teach in all of our schools. Yeah, because he wrote the history of the Quran and he struggled with the different narratives that are found in there. So this is why, rather than struggle, why do we just accept it? Shwali comes later in the 1900s before he died, just before he died, about 19, early 1900s. He died in 1919. And he agreed with Noldeke and said that this must, this he put his rubber stamp on it. Though what was interesting, he didn't agree with the first recension. He didn't agree with the Abu Bakr recension. So here is interesting. Here you have two German scholars who are saying, let's accept the Uthmanic recension as the official text, though one of them saying, but I don't accept the first one. So why didn't he accept the first one if he accepts the second one? Yeah, if I, if I may interject something, again, it goes back to the history of the Quran that Nerdlecki, uh, um, you know, Theodore Nerdlecki wrote about because he discovered that there are multiple accounts about the first recension. One says Abu Bakr, another one suggests it was Omar himself. And that's why there is the struggle about at least uh, solidifying that first recension. So again, you go back to the second recension and accept it and move on. You're kind of jumping the gun again because we're going to get to that because that's well, you problems. didn't tell me about that, oh, so right, that's, that's why right. I'm jumping the we're gun. We're going to get to there, but you all are a little take a little bit of my thunder away by saying that. Let's continue on. Thank you, John Lord. Burton in the 1970s. So he's more in our lifetime. Uh, he agrees with both of them, and he says this uh, in in 1977 on page 174, 226, and 234. A perfect this is a say this is a perfect example of a prevalence of investigation by intuition in the story collaborative work on the history of the Quran. So he's agree with it, but he's been a little bit cryptic in this in his constant. Alfred Welch in the Encyclopedia of Islam, which is the standard work now that gives the whole story. 
1986 said it best when he wrote, the unanimity with which an official text is attributed to Uthman in the face of a lack of convincing evidence to the contrary leads most Western scholars to accept that the Quran we have today, at least in terms of the number and arrangement of the surahs and the basic structure of the continental text, goes back to the time of Uthman, under whose authority the official text was produced. He wrote that in 1986. This has become the standard. You open up the Encyclopedia of Islam, and that's what you're going to get. So this is the norm. This has now become canonized within thinking, within thought. I, I, and, I mean, all the studies that I had done, and you grew up with this, uh, didn't call it Noldekishwali, uh, but here in the West, they call it the Noldekishwali because it, it is almost like a rubber stamp that everybody must follow, don't question. It just makes three. You notice what the Welch says, um, uh, convincing evidence to, there's no convincing evidence to the contrary, like no one's ever questioned this. Well, Shoemaker is going to do just that. He's going to have a lot of problems with this. And he may be one of the first that actually puts it into print. But it's not he's not the first to think so. Others have said so, but no one's been paying attention. There is lots mm -hmm. of problem with the Noldeki Shwali paradigm. But we need to introduce it. It's that important. It has become the canonical uh, viewpoint for almost all our scholarship here in the United States. It's the same way over in Europe. Why has it become there? What we're going to do we're going to look at some other possibilities and some difficulties in the next episode because already Shoemaker is coming up with uh, difficulties that he's come up with and also he's going to show you that which Uthmanic recension are we talking about? Because there's <laughs> there, there are there are almost 10 different possibilities he's going to come up with, but I'm going to hold off and show you in the next episode what we're talking about. Well, I mean, we, we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, so uh, let's go back again now to these claims by Noldeki, Shwali, Alfred, uh, basically. Um, it's, it's obvious to me that these scholars at least acknowledge one important fact. Uthman, a human being, whom you and I do not know of a single hadith reference that he was given an authority by the Prophet of Islam, or at least that he received revelation or inspirations to collect the Quran as we know it today, or even he was given the authority by the Islamic community to be the guy who can spearhead collecting what was revealed to Muhammad, right? No. So they're acknowledging it's a human being by the name of Uthman is the single person who's responsible for the Quran today. There flies the idea that the Quran was revealed by Allah and preserved by Allah. That's number one. Number two, how can these scholars back then or even today reconcile the differences between the claim that we have later Quranic manuscripts, let's say 8th, 9th century, 10th century, and anything that is apparent to us, it could have been earlier than that, writings that were earlier than the standard narrative at least, meaning there is a fluidity at least up until a certain point before the standardization of the reading. How can they reconcile the fact that Allah, according to the Quran, preserved his word, what the modern scholars, as you showed it correctly, not a letter changed, not a word changed, not a phrase changed. How can all of these scholars, whether Muslim or, uh, you know, Islamicist, reconcile all of this? They can't, and you'll see why. But that's what Shoemaker, Shoemaker is going to bring those very points up. So hold on, folks. We're not finished yet. There's an awful lot yet we have to unpack. It just gets better and better. And what are we going to share next time so that people are prepared? Look at, at these 10 possibilities. What 10 possibilities for what? For the Uthmanic. What Uthmanic recension are they talking about? Right. So we are going to talk about possibilities concerning what we call the Uthmanic Quran. Now, by the way, the, the name Uthmanic Quran is telling in and of itself because it's not called the Muhammadan Quran. It is not called the Allah's Quran. It's called Uthmanic Quran. And that in and of itself can send a lot of bills and whistles uh, when it comes to and alarms. And Shoemaker is going to ask that question yeah. as well, but that's yet to come. Wonderful. Thank you as always. Thank you everyone for watching. We encourage you as always to subscribe to our channel, our YouTube channel, Sierra International. Share it with others as well. And we truly encourage you as well to consider becoming part of our Patreon team. Your support will help in producing such quality videos bring in scholars and uh, wonderful guests like Dr. J. Smith. And at the same time, our hope at the end of the day is to bring awareness about all of these issues. Uh, we want our Muslim friends, whether they have access to the Arabic 
or not, whether they have access to material like this or not. We want to dissect things for them. We want to make it so simple and easy for them to go ahead and investigate the material we're sharing, examine the evidence that we are presenting, in hope that you will come home to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the whole idea. We love you. We want you to know the truth. We're not here to try to antagonize you. We're not here to try to attack you. We're doing this because we care for you and we care for your soul. We care for your eternity. So hopefully the message of love is well received. Until next time, this is Al-Fadi. God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.